Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, breaking news from Boston on the growing cries to shut down the failing, aging Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station, which suffered another emergency shutdown last week. I'll have an interview with Diane Turco of Cape Downwinders, who was arrested with two others last Friday after delivering a letter demanding immediate shutdown of Pilgrim to the Massachusetts Governor's Office. Later, we'll hear two reports on the USA's nuclear wild, wild west. Allison Gitlin of the Grand Canyon Sierra Club on uranium mining issues threatening our great national monument and Matt Pachenza of Heal, Utah, on downwinder, radioactive waste, and new nuclear build issues in that part of the world. Plus, our regular numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness, the nuclear reactor duck and cover report on what's gone wrong this week with those rust buckets, and more honest nuclear information than will be discussed by anybody at this week's Excellence in Journalism conference, unless they happen to be talking with me. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, September 13, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from a different perspective. Starting with this breaking story. Last week, the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station on Cape Cod Bay, just south of Boston, suffered another emergency shutdown. And longtime watchdog and nuclear awareness group Cape Cod Downwinders sounded the alarm, in part by writing a letter demanding immediate shutdown and delivering it directly to the governor's office, where three of their members were arrested. Just this morning, I spoke with Diane Turco, longtime Cape Downwinders member, on the actions the group has taken since last week's emergency scram shutdown and how things went at her arraignment hearing today. Last week, Pilgrim experienced an emergency shutdown, another scram, and we said enough is enough. We will not tolerate one more scram. So we developed a closed Pilgrim Now State House action. And we went up to the governor's office and brought him a letter and asked him to call for the immediate closure of Pilgrim. It was our intention that it is now time to confront a government that is failing the people of the Commonwealth, and we cannot wait any longer. Like I said, this past week, Pilgrim had yet another scram, an emergency shutdown due to malfunctioning safety equipment, and already acknowledged by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as one of the worst operating reactors in the U.S. in one step from federally mandated shutdown, Pilgrim is a real threat right now to our families and greater community, So another Pilgrim shutdown is so unacceptable. To keep Pilgrim open to protect Entergy's bottom line rather than the health and safety of the public is immoral and dangerous. To ignore the documented dangers is irresponsible. And to ignore the public's pleas for safety is undemocratic. So we said we must stand together. The power of the people can break the corporate political control that jeopardizes our health and safety. So enough is enough and the time is now. So we let Governor Bacon know that New York Governor Cuomo called for the closing of Indian Point due to the lack of effective emergency plans to protect people within 50 miles of New York City, and Vermont Governor Shumlin committed to close Vermont Yankee and it closed. So now Governor Baker must step up and speak to the people of Massachusetts and do the same here by calling for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to permanently close Pilgrim now. Talk about the action that took place last Friday. We delivered a letter, like I said, to the governor and outlined our concerns, the failing inspections, the poor assessments. You know, the aging and degraded Pilgrim Reactor continues to operate in the shadow of almost 5 million citizens, and we're expecting him to work in our best interest. We said the public has no confidence in Entergy or the NRC to keep us safe. So we had been writing to the governor regarding this for about a year and a half to two years, and our letters have not met with much response, and we have not been given the governor's position on Pilgrim and our call for closure. 
in 2013, all the, the towns in Cape Cod and Five and Martha's Vineyard voted for the governor, called for the closure. So we have the public already supporting closure. And we also know, as you know, is that there is no escape from the Cape, that the state of Massachusetts is planning to close the bridges and relocate us, not evacuate us, but relocate us, and that's unconscionable. We also know that Senator Demarkey is such a proponent in our favor when he declared that, quote, the NRC has abdicated its responsibility to ensure public health and safety in New England and across the country. So Pilgrim is not safe. We went to the State House to deliver the letter, and we said we would not leave until Governor Baker committed to calling for the closure of Pilgrim. When you say we, who are you referring to, and what was the response? Jake Downwinders, along with some people from Boston Downwinders, on behalf of Planet Earth, there were nine of us in the office, called on Governor's staff. He wasn't there. We weren't really expecting to see him. By staff, we told them that we needed him to respond to our letter. We actually had sent the letter that morning and made an appointment to see them at 2.30. So they knew we were coming, and they knew the contents of the letter. And we sat down with them, explained the letter, and said, we'll wait till we hear from the governor. And they said, well, we'll get back to you, you know, what we've heard before. Well, we'll get back to you. We, they don't get back to us. So we said we're staying until the governor makes a determination of what he's going to do here. So we stayed in the office, and then it became closing time, and uh, the police, they warned us that we needed to leave or we could risk arrest, and the police arrested three of us at about 7.30 that evening. We didn't leave the office. We didn't get a response from the governor either. What has happened since that time? Today we had our arraignment. We were arraigned at the Boston Municipal Courthouse, and the results of our arraignment today were that we are pleading not guilty, we are looking for a trial, so the judge has barred us from entering the Massachusetts State House. Now, we do a lot of lobbying work. We do tons of lobbying work. We've had rallies and programs at the State House, and now we're being barred from doing our work. What is it might file a motion of appeal? I know that there was an editorial that appeared in the Boston Globe. What's happening as a result of these actions? Well, you know what? We are thrilled because, you know, Cape Down Winters has been so active here on the Cape, and the public down here understands the issue. And we're thrilled that today, in the opinion section, an editorial in the Boston Globe is titled, Too Risky to Wait for Pilgrim Plants Shutdown. They're saying that three more years is too late, too long. And we are thrilled about that. It didn't really talk about the arrests or any of that. It talked about Pilgrim and how dangerous it is and how it needs to be shut down. We are thrilled. I think the big story here is that it's time to confront a government that is failing the people of the Commonwealth. And we stood up and said to the governor, you need to pay attention to this danger. Right now, you need to call for the immediate closure of Pilgrim. That's the editorial in the Boston Globe. It's not talking about people being arrested at the State House, but all of our background actions have led to an editorial the first time the Boston Globe has come out and made this kind of statement. Now, our Cape Cod Times is a fabulous newspaper on the Cape. Four months ago, they called for the immediate shutdown. I have been following their articles. Christine Legere, I think, is their primary writer, and she's done a fabulous job of covering your issues. She certainly has. She does her research. She's educating the public, and I don't think we would have gotten as far as we have without her reporting. Where do you go from here? What are the next steps that you can talk about? Well, that's what we're going to talk about in our meeting tomorrow. We want to keep open dialogue with the governor. I think he understands that we're very serious about this, and we will continue to work with him to get Pilgrim closed and convince him that this is what he needs to do, is to step up as the public safety officer for the state of Massachusetts and demand that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission close Pilgrim now. Diane, how can we support you? We're asking people to call the governor's office and just say, please demand that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission close Pilgrim. We need people to be calling him because... It's on his plate right now. It's the issue that he's looking at today and in the Boston Globe. So if people call the uh, governor's office, it's 617-725-4005. Just keep it straight and simple. Governor Baker, please demand the Nuclear Regulatory Commission close Pilgrim now. Enough is enough. Diane Turco of Cape Downwinders. We will have a link up to that Boston Globe editorial which is entitled, It's Too Risky to Wait for Pilgrim Plants Shutdown, 
and also a link to the Cape Downwinders website. This will be on NuclearHotSeat.com under this episode, number 273. Meanwhile, make those phone calls to Governor Baker's office. The number again is 617-725-4005. It will only take a moment. It will help speed the shutdown of Pilgrim, and it's very satisfying activism. Now for the nuclear reactor duck (coughs) and cover report. At Grand Gulf in Mississippi on September 8th, there was a technical specification shutdown due to loss of residual heat removal pump. (coughs) Update on an event at LaSalle in Illinois, which happened on July 11th. A reactor protective system motor generator set tripped because of a blown power fuse, which was the result of worn insulation on one of the generator output leads. And they say these things aren't falling apart. (coughs) On Saturday, September 10, at Davis-Bessey in Ohio, rainwater leaked through a roof vent, and from there into the generator's voltage-regulating controls, which are located in an electrical cabinet in a room underneath the turbine floor. (coughs) And a trifecta for Palo Verde in Arizona. A manual reactor trip due to stuck open pressure main spray valve. Next day, the loss of the seismic monitoring system computer because of a power spike which caused a temporary loss of power to the power generating station. And an update on a July event regarding actuation of an essential spray pond, a system which serves as an ultimate heat sink, meaning a last-ditch safety feature in an overheating reactor scenario. Duck! (coughs) In North St. Louis... Last week, Senator Roy Blunt and his Democratic challenger, Jason Kander, were each invited to speak with Just Moms STL, a nonprofit group concerned with the radioactive waste found in Bridgeton's Westlake landfill. Kander saw fit to make an appearance. Blunt, meanwhile, opted to sit this one out, instead attending a fundraising event at a country club only 15 minutes away. He really knows where his priorities are. And now... Nuclear hot seat... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out a week. The White House has announced the winners of the 2016 Green Gov Presidential Awards, honoring those who have gone above and beyond to implement innovative sustainability projects within the government. And the Keeping It Clean Award goes to Rocky Flats the former nuclear weapons production facility and plutonium-contaminated Superfund site near Denver that exposed the local population to a quarter-mile trench of blowing excavated radioactive material while it attempted to patch the ongoing problem. The still-radioactive location is now used as a wildlife preserve, and a new housing development is there for the gullible and the ignorant. The award is for what's described as an innovative groundwater treatment system that runs on batteries and recharges with, wait for it, solar power. Does anyone else see the irony here? The spin is making me dizzy. And that's why whoever attached the White House name to this boondoggle, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. Over to Japan, where an estimated 300,000 cubic meters of waste will be generated as a result of radioactive decontamination work in a suspended section of the Joban Line, operated by East Japan Railway Company in Fukushima Prefecture. They don't have enough space to temporarily keep that much waste, and it's known that previous decontamination efforts left debris and dirt in plastic garbage bags piled pyramids high and then left to decay in the sun, in the wind, in the rain, and be washed right back into the environment. Fukushima dairy farmers plan to restart milk shipments later this year. The same farmers who were asked to kill their cattle following the 2011 triple meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi. A new documentary by Tamotsu Matsubara called Nuclear Cattle will be featured on this show in the coming weeks. Internationally, North Korea conducted its fifth and largest test of a nuclear weapon, estimated to be 20 to 30 kilotons, the equivalent of the bomb dropped on Nagasaki. Dr. Timothy Mousseau reports from the ground at Chernobyl, where he's continuing his biological research, that the recent fires in the zone have increased radiation levels at least two to threefold. 
And next week, a report on the impact of the BBC Panorama documentary Sellafield's Nuclear Safety Failings with Nuclear Hot Seat European correspondent Sean McGee, based in Ireland. We'll have today's featured interviews in just a moment. But first, my ongoing thanks to all of you who help support the show. Whether you choose to buy me a cup of coffee that no one will ever drink, what I call the Starbucks donation, either as a one-off gift or a monthly recurring donation, or perhaps send something larger when you can. And keeping you up to date on the hottest of the nuclear stories. Plus, your kind words and messages help keep me in good heart. Because of you, I am off this Friday to the Excellence in Journalism Conference in New Orleans, a four-day conference where I will meet as many as I can of the more than 1,000 reporters, news directors, editors, syndicators, and media pros of all sorts to talk about the need to cover their neighborhood nuclear issues. And it's the support of you, the listeners, who have made this trip possible. I'm still a little short on ground transportation and meals, so if you can still help out, that would really be appreciated. The way to do so is easy. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. You can donate by PayPal, use your credit or debit card, and if you prefer to send a check, you can get a snail mail address to use by sending an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. Whatever you can do to help, thank you, thank you, and by the way, thank you. This week, we take a look at America's wild, wild nuclear west with two separate interviews. The first is with Allison Gitlin, the conservation coordinator for Restore and Protect the Greater Grand Canyon campaign of the Sierra Club Grand Canyon chapter. We previously interviewed Allison for last year's episodes number 192 and 199. Here's the latest on Grand Canyon uranium mining issues. Allison Gitlin, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you for having me. Allison, we talked back in February of 2015 about uranium mining in the Grand Canyon. But for those who may be new to the issue or need a refresher course, give us some background so we can understand the context. There is a long history of uranium mining in the Grand Canyon region. There are over 500 abandoned uranium mines on the Navajo Nation in the northeast corner of the state. And there have been historically several mine claims and developing mines north and south of Grand Canyon. In the 80s, the price of uranium dropped, and some of the mines that were in development or had been operational went on to what's called standby mode, where they were just left the fence up, but there were no operations going. And when the price of uranium spiked in the middle of the last decade, All of a sudden, we started seeing a ton of claims being established around Grand Canyon. So by 2008, there were a couple thousand claims around Grand Canyon. Starting in 2012, there began to be a limit on new mines. The Obama administration declared that there would be no new uranium mining around Grand Canyon for 20 years. That is the longest that a presidential administration can create such a moratorium uh, without an act of Congress. And so right now we're four years into that, and there's supposed to be science happening during that time. But, of course, the science is being funded with a very limited budget. So there's not a whole lot of science moving forward from what we hear. But there are a few mines that have been allowed to operate that were considered to be valid claims that existed before the time of the moratorium. There was an environmental impact statement back in 1986 that cited one of the mines in the area, the Orphan Mine, as an example of how mining could be done safely. This was their term at the time. What's been discovered there in the ensuing 20 years? So the Orphan Mine is literally on the edge of Grand Canyon. It's within Grand Canyon National Park, and it was a grandfathered in claim. It was originally a copper mine. And that mine, as you say, was cited as being safe uranium mining without impact. Well, after the environmental impact statement for another uranium mine, the Canyon Mine, cited that as an example of safe mining, the Environmental Protection Agency later went in 
and did some examinations of the area, and they found that soil at the surface was contaminated with uranium. Quite a distance outside of the fence line, the head frame that was there was hot. It was radioactive. And two creeks below the orphan mine, Horn Creek and Salt Creek, were both contaminated with uranium. And so hikers who come through the area are warned not to drink from Horn Creek, not to use any water, to pack their own water in that part of Grand Canyon. And, of course, wildlife can't read signs, so they are still using the water. What was the result of the 2010 USGS study of groundwater contamination at sites that had previously been mined around the Grand Canyon? There were 15 springs that were associated with mining that showed contamination and five wells that were associated with mining that showed contamination. Pretty much every single place that the U.S. Geological Survey looked for surface contamination, soil contamination associated with mines, they found it. So all of these, you know, supposedly reclaimed, restored mines, every single one of them had some level of soil contamination. And in some cases, for example, the Kanab North Mine, which was a mine that had gone on standby for decades, for like 20 years, it had left this pile of rock on site, and the wind had just been blowing that. And the U.S. Geological Survey measured a bunch of soil samples, and they never actually found the edge of how far out that contamination had gone. In other cases, they found that there were places where floods had come through and exposed some buried contamination and actually washed it downstream quite a ways. And in that report, they said that they weren't sure that that could be cleaned up because they couldn't tell how far down it had gone and it would be difficult to identify all of the rock that had washed down from these piles, these ore piles. Now there is a current threat with the Canyon uranium mine. Tell us why, even with a 20-year moratorium, the canyon mine has become a threat again. Some of the mines are considered to be viable or validated claims. And what this means is that they're economically viable claims, supposedly. So they have demonstrated that there's actually ore that should be mined or, you know, that can be mined, I should say. And they have demonstrated that they could do this and make a profit. Those mines are being allowed to move forward to develop or to continue operating. And King & Mine is one of these. It started developing in the 80s, never reached the ore. The price of uranium dropped. It went on standby for almost 30 years. And now, 30 years later, it is drilling down to the ore. They estimate it will take about another year to drill down to the ore. And because they have supposedly an economically viable claim, they are being allowed to develop. Now, that is really questionable because a couple of years ago, the price of uranium started to drop again. Kenyon Mine, again, put its operations on hold for a year. So what is considered an economically viable claim when the price of uranium is so volatile and it moves up and down? This mine is close enough on the edge of viability that in the middle of reopening just shut down for a year, right? Still, the government seems to be behind it, or at least the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality is issuing or has issued new air quality permits to three uranium mines within 20 miles of the Grand Canyon, including this one. What's wrong with this picture? (laughs) There's a lot of things wrong with this picture. You know, the Environmental Protection Agency can only monitor certain things. A lot is really left up to the state when it comes to uranium mining. And so the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality issued both the aquifer protection permits that are supposed to protect the groundwater and the air quality permits for these mines. So the aquifer protection permits, I mean, these things are pathetic. They were like four pages long. And they basically just said, well, there's no groundwater in contact with these mines, so we're fine. Totally ignoring the fact that groundwater recharge happens through the areas where this uranium is found. The air quality permits that are in the process of getting reissued are a little bit more extensive, but I found them to be equally problematic. Uh, For example, the radon emissions, the way that they were monitoring or limiting radon emissions was actually as a function of how much ore was moved. So there was no hard cap on how much these mines could release as far as radon. They just could release a certain amount of radon per 
unit of rock that they moved, which I see as a real problem. As far as dust control, they have sensors within the mine area and also 100 feet outside the mine area, and they test the sensors 100 feet out like once a year, And if those are found to be contaminated, then they increase their monitoring to quarterly and they make some, you know, simple adjustments. And then if, if that increases again, then they actually have to stop contaminating, you know, putting controls. But there's not anything that says that you have to restore these areas, that if you find contamination off site, you need to clean up that contamination. It just says you have to monitor more often. And there's no requirements to do things like put walls around the ore piles or covers on the ore piles until after contamination has been found. And we've seen that there's been contamination in every other mine that we've looked at. So this isn't a question of if, it's a question of when. And these mines don't have to do anything to prevent that when. They only have to go in afterwards and say, oopsie, and, you know, make a half-assed effort to prevent future contamination. It's just stunning because do they bother to consider the economics of the tourist industry of the Grand Canyon and the fact that people from around the world go there to enjoy the natural beauty and aren't expecting uranium contamination? No, and there's there's a couple aspects to that. I mean, one is the very real effect that this mine could have not only on Grand Canyon National Park but on the Havasupai tribe who also depend on tourism and have these beautiful world-renowned waterfalls on the reservation and if that water gets contaminated you can't clean it up right and you know same thing in Grand Canyon National Park if these springs are contaminated then the hikers and backpackers that rely on them not to mention the wildlife but you know as far as human impact those springs become off limit and you know it's just tough luck right there's no accountability there's no we don't know how to clean this up the other aspect of it is the trucks that are going to be on the road so you've got a high volume of tourists if you've ever driven a Grand Canyon National Park Extension Skate you know there's a Mm -hmm. high volume of tourists on the road and we're going to have 10 to 12 trucks per day so 20 to 24 including the return trip sharing the road with tourists and residents of these areas. They're going to make their way through Williams, Arizona, Flagstaff, Arizona, Cameron, Kayanta, Tuba City. You know, they're going to go through the Navajo Nation on their way to the mill, which is in Blanding, Utah. And so these trucks are going to be sharing the road with not only the tourists, but the residents. There is very little plan for what to do if there's an accident. The last I heard was they were going to call somebody down from landing. So, you know, if a truck turns over in a rainstorm in a community, then there's just uranium washing away, right? So there's really no viable plan for how they're going to deal with cleanup. There's no viable plan for how they're going to notify nearby residents. It's going to be up to the operator or the emergency response team or the truckers to decide if they want to notify the nearby residents if there is a problem. And then, you know, I think beyond the actual real threat that comes with this, because these trucks also, I should mention, are only going to be covered by a tarp. So any dust they pick up on site or any dust that's within is going to be flying in the wind, and we all know northern Arizona has a lot of wind. But there's also the other risk, which is the media risk and the economic risk. If there is a uranium truck accident reported on the road to Grand Canyon, is that where you want to plan your next vacation? Not necessarily. And so there's another risk that's this perception of risk that people have when they're planning where they're going to travel to and if they want to deal with that. And so I think it's very important for our northern Arizona business community to understand what they are contending with as well. The Havasupai Tribe, Sierra Club, and other conservation groups are suing the U.S. Forest Service over the canyon mine going back into operation. What are some of the points of contention that you're arguing? For one, we don't believe that the canyon mine really should have been considered an economically viable mine and allowed to move forward. We think that there should have been a reexamination of the plan of operations and environmental impact statement because there is significant new information 
For example, Red Butte, which is a traditional cultural property of the Havasupai, wasn't even established as a traditional cultural property at that time. Now it is. The Orphan Mine was not considered to be contaminated at that time, and now we know it was. Based on those two things alone, there should have been a re-examination of the science and the cultural values before this mine was allowed to move forward. So we think that there needs to be a new public process or a new evaluation of whether the canyon mine should be there. The other thing that's going on in the legal realm is that the mining industry does not want this 20-year ban to stand, and so they are trying to overturn that ban, and we have been supporting the federal government in keeping that ban in place. In late August, there were a series of public hearings regarding the proposed reopening of the canyon mine. Were you in attendance in any of these, and if so, What's your sense of how they went? I attended the hearing that was in Flagstaff. There were three hearings, one in Fredonia, one in Tuba City, which is on the Navajo Nation, and one in Flagstaff. The one in Fredonia, I've heard, was extremely lightly attended. The other two, interestingly enough, were on Election Day. They were on the day of our primary election, which was very frustrating because I think a lot of We're really torn about whether to attend this hearing, whether to go vote. You know, if you have a real work day and you can't necessarily take a bunch of time off, I should mention the Tuba City hearing was during the day. It seemed almost rigged to get as little attendance as possible. Mm -hmm. And I heard that that one was pretty lightly attended. The one in Flagstaff was in the evening. We actually had a lot of people who came off the reservation to attend that one in the evening. I would say there were 40 or 50 people there and maybe 30 spoke. Really, really compelling stories. I heard a lot of healthcare workers who were telling tragic stories of what they have seen, the illness that they have seen from uranium mining in this region. I heard a lot of people who had lost family members giving very passionate stories about why they don't want to see any more mining in this area. I heard really rational scientific reasons from several members of the community on why they didn't think that these mines should move forward, why the science didn't justify mining this region any longer. And I heard really good suggestions for how these permits could be made more effective and, you know, how we could be more preventative instead of reactionary when we issue these permits. We'll see if any of those comments were taken into consideration. You know, from my previous experience, the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality will say thank you very much and then just go ahead and issue the permits. Yeah, unfortunately, that is so often the case. What's next for you and the Sierra Club in fighting against Canyon Mine and the rest of the uranium mining? Well, we're going to continue the legal battle to oppose Canyon Mine because Unfortunately, that is the last realm of action that we seem to have to fight that. But what we are trying to do is we are trying to convince President Obama to declare a Greater Grand Canyon Heritage National Monument, and that would prevent new uranium mining in the region. It still wouldn't do anything to fight the existing mines, but it would put a permanent ban on new uranium mining around Grand Canyon. And so we are encouraging people to contact President Obama and let him know that they want this to happen before he leaves office. It would be a great legacy. It would be a great way to celebrate the centennial of the National Park Service. It is long overdue that the plateaus on either side of Grand Canyon are as protected as the canyon itself because we all know water flows downhill and we need to protect what's above in order to protect what's below. Allison, what can we do to assist and support you in the work? Well, I encourage everybody to become educated on this monument proposal to sign a petition. There's several online petitions that people could search for. And so if you sign a petition, we recently announced that we have 550,000 signatures. We would love to bring that up to a million. And then the final thing is we are hoping 
that there will be a public meeting for this monument proposal sometime in the future, and we encourage people to keep an ear open for that. And if they hear that there is going to be a public meeting, to do anything they can to get there and to speak in favor of protecting this region forever. And, of course, people could also speak to their local political representatives, write letters to the editor. You know, we need to show a lot of political support so that if Obama does this, he knows that the American people are behind him. Allison, thanks for the update. Thanks for the great work that you and the others there are doing. And thanks again for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. You are so welcome. Thank you for what you do. That was Allison Gitlin of the Sierra Club Grand Canyon Chapter. We'll have links up to their site and the talking points on stopping Grand Canyon uranium mining up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 273. Continuing our report on the U.S.'s wild, wild nuclear west, we move up to Utah, which has a range of nuclear issues. Matt Pachenza is the executive director of the environmental group Heal Utah. He brought us up to speed on the nuclear issues faced by that state and an unusual activist decision regarding two proposed new nuclear reactors meant to be sited on the Green River. Matt Pachenza. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Delighted to be here. Let's start out with what is your background and how did you become involved with Heal Utah? Yeah, I have a a career that's been a mix of nonprofits and journalism. So I've worked for nonprofits in the health, theater, and environmental arena. In addition to that, I uh, was a, a newspaper reporter and a magazine writer for a certain part of my career. And then at some point, for primarily due to family circumstances, moved to Utah and set out to look for work. And at that point, to be honest, the world of journalism had really changed, mostly just because of shrinking revenues and smaller staff. So that path wasn't available to me anymore and looked about and, and found myself a scrappy environmental organization that needed uh, some staff. And so I, I began at Heal as the policy director about five and a half years ago. And then the last year and a half plus, I've been the executive director. Utah, of course, is downwind from the Nevada test site, where above-ground nuclear bombs were exploded in the 1950s and the early 1960s. What can you tell us about the legacy of these tests and heal Utah's involvement with any of these cases? Our downwinder legacy does make Utah a pretty unique place to work on these days, which is more of a focus on nuclear waste and nuclear power. But it is fair to say that for many generations, we've had people affected by America's broad involvement in the many fingers of the nuclear complex. You know, you had tests that ran for decades, pretty close to here. And because of geography and prevailing wind, communities from southern Utah, most prominently, but even including up to northern Utah, did bear the brunt of that fallout. In this case, fallout's not a metaphor, but an actual scientific term. So scientifically documented by health studies, we have increased rates of a variety of conditions and illnesses, including, of course, cancer and immunodiseases. So, you know, that phenomenon began to be understood probably even beginning in the 60s and certainly into the 70s and 80s. At some point, a federal law was passed in order to provide people that had suffered uh, in certain counties a certain amount of compensation and assistance because of that. So all of that kind of lays the groundwork for when proposals have arisen within the state of Utah to both dispose of nuclear waste and then most recently to site a nuclear power plant. There's probably a bit more suspicion and skepticism and concern that ordinary Utahns and even elected officials have manifested because of this historic legacy of having sort of been, you know, misled and not entirely been honest with by the federal government in the past. Give us a rundown on some of the existing and historic nuclear issues in Utah. Of course, we would start with the downwinder legacy and all the many nuclear weapons tests that occurred in the Nevada desert. And then moving to more recently, a small company called EnviroCare took over a a state waste facility out in our West Desert. And then throughout the 2000s, that company grew rather dramatically and became known uh, ultimately as Energy Solutions. 
a huge nuclear waste company which has operations uh, globally. And so in the 2000s, that company very aggressively in, in a series of efforts sought to bring more and more and hotter waste to our West Desert. And so Heal Utah really was an organization that became very well known in the context of seeking to limit some of the waste that they brought out there, namely hotter waste, Class B and C waste, and then as well uh, waste from other countries, namely Italy. So that's one chapter of kind of more modern fights in which Utah has sought to resist efforts to have us be kind of the dumping ground, as we might say, for various issues. Another one I would mention a little more quickly is that, as people know, undoubtedly, you know, high-level nuclear waste is an issue that has played out in a lot of America. And so, as people undoubtedly know, the high-level nuclear waste in nuclear power plants is essentially stored on site at every individual power plant across the country. I think we'd all agree that's not a great idea. But the various solutions that I've proposed aren't terribly good either. And one of those at one point was to cite, quote, interim, an interim solution not too far west of Salt Lake City on the Goshu Native American Reservation. That proposal is known by various terms, but the company behind it was a consortium of utilities called Private Fuel Storage. So we tend to call it Private Fuel Storage or PFS here. That played out in kind of the mid to late 2000s, and, and the good news is that proposal ultimately failed. What ended up happening was that Utah's congressional delegation didn't like it. And so because of that, various machinations occurred, which led uh, Utah to reject that bid. So, you know, our main fights lately have been about uh, trying to limit the efforts of a private nuclear waste company called Energy Solutions, and then secondarily, one to resist a bid by a consortium of utilities to put higher level waste there. Now there is a proposal to put two nuclear reactors on the Green River in Utah. Who's behind this, and how and when did the process to create them get started? Yeah, so it's been amazingly, I think, over nine years or right around nine years. There was a sitting state legislator, a state representative from up here in northern Utah, from near Provo, and he was on a committee that heard some kind of a general topic on nuclear power back in 2007. And he didn't disclose during that hearing that he had any interest himself in nuclear power, but a journalist discovered that he had disclosed it on a form, and that led for this story to break, which was that Representative Aaron Tilton, then Representative Aaron Tilton, had formed a company to explore bringing nuclear power to Utah. That company at that time was known as Transition Power Development, but relatively soon it became known as Blue Castle Holdings, and that remains its name today. And Blue Castle Holdings' vision is to site um, a pair of nuclear reactors on the Green River, quite close to the village of Green River, and that would be essentially in central southern Utah. And, you know, we're nine years into that, and, you know, we can certainly talk in much more detail about where they're at, but I think the very quick version was they had some early successes, for sure, some significant early successes, but since then, they have struggled, frankly, to gain much purchase and much support. So it's a project right now which is teetering, feels like a sort of generous assessment. What is wrong with citing the nuclear reactors on the Green River, in addition to the obvious, which is that it's upstream of the Grand Canyon National Park? Yeah, I think there are a range of concerns. And one thing I find interesting about working on this issue is that people are motivated to oppose this particular proposal for really a wide range of reasons. And I think some of us might point to more kind of economic issues or concerns about the significant amount of water that the reactors might use. This is a very water-intensive form of making electricity in a region that's really struggling to have enough water, period. The Colorado River system, which the Green River is a part of, is wildly overtaxed and is dwindling because of climate change. So to cite such a water-consumptive form of power in the heart of this struggling water system just really seems like a terrible idea. Nuclear power, as we all know, is very costly, and so the economics of nuclear power certainly motivates some people's opposition as well. And then there are certainly people who, of course, will raise concerns about safety. The nuclear power industry has had several high-profile problems over the years, and, and certainly people's fears that something like that could happen here is, is one of the factors that some people would identify as a reason to oppose it. You know, it's an interesting broad tent you bring into the concerns about nuclear power world, and I think they do raise a lot of issues for a lot of different people. But we all, I think, who are part of that would agree that this particular location is certainly a particularly poor choice for nuclear reactors. 
Now, Blue Castle did gain the permission or the legal right to draw water from the river should these reactors be built. And more recently, the Utah Court of Appeals heard this case again, and they have again decided that it's okay to pull the water out. Heal Utah and your partners, Living Rivers and Uranium Watch, have had a perhaps unusual response to this, given the ongoing nature of so many battles against nuclear. Tell us about the hearings leading up to these decisions and what decision has been made following them in terms of the follow-up by your organization and the others. By far the most significant success for Blue Castle so far has been successfully securing water to cool the reactors. And so in Utah, um, I think much of the West, we have water districts, and Blue Castle was able to uh, lease a significant amount of water from a pair of southern Utah water districts. Under state law, leases of a significant amount of water like that are subject to review. And so there was an internal review process, which we, of course, intervened in, and we were unsuccessful. The state agency did, in fact, approve those leases. And then at that point, you uh, face a decision about essentially going to court to challenge that. So we did do that. And back in 2013, we had a trial um, in Price, Utah, in which we challenged those water right leases. It was an incredibly interesting trial. I think we were very proud that we were able to mount a really strong case. We had um, some terrific experts from around the country who testified on our behalf. Who are some of those people? Heal and our allies were able to bring two experts in particular that folks may have heard of. Uh, One of them is Arnie Gunderson, a nuclear safety expert and a former NRC person. And he came in and testified about the risks of nuclear power and did a terrific job. Another one is uh, Mark Cooper, who's a financial expert who I believe is affiliated with the University of Vermont. And so Mark Cooper came in and spoke about how speculative and financially unrealistic nuclear power projects are at this stage. So the the trial in Price in many ways went very well. We really were pleased with the information we put out there. Uh, The other fantastic value of that trial was what we learned. And we learned a lot about Blue Castle and frankly about its incredibly shaky financial underpinnings and how very little money they had raised and how essentially this whole thing was kind of built on a house of cards. So the trial was great, really valuable experience. Unfortunately, the judge did rule to defer to the state engineer's decision and to uphold these water right leases. We then faced a decision about what to do then, and we ultimately chose to appeal that decision to the state court of appeals. Had a hearing in that case in 2015, and then received a decision earlier this year in 2016. That decision was as well, unfortunately, unfavorable. As a result, the decision has been made to not pursue any further legal standing on this case. Tell us why and how that decision was reached. Once the State Court of Appeals ruled again to uphold the transfer of the water rights, he and our allies, namely a pair of Southern Utah organizations called Living Rivers and, and Uranium Watch, you know, we just sat down and really thought carefully about the right way to proceed. And What we ultimately realized is that this project is frankly kind of going nowhere. And I'd be happy to list all the many ways in which that's true, but basically they've raised almost no money. They have no interest from utilities, a major problem when you're trying to build a huge electricity plant. And they just aren't really moving forward in any significant way. They've had no contact with the NRC in five years. They're not doing all the studies they would have to do to actually submit their license application. So we look at a project that's basically stalled. And the nature of the contracts that Blue Castle has with these two Utah water rights districts is that once the legal action is completed, they have to start making some pretty hefty payments to those water districts. They will total $180,000 a year for five years, and then they'll go on up to, I think, $580,000. So we basically decided, you know what, we could petition the next level of court in Utah to hear this appeal. The reality is that they don't even have to hear it. They could have just turned down that petition. Even if they did hear it, the reality is that the odds were against us. And so we said, you know what, let's end this. Let's just end the legal battle and let's essentially let the market decide. Because honestly, even if we've been losing in the courts, we've been winning in the market and we've been winning in the public. And there just isn't any interest in this project. No one wants the power. No one wants to give the money to to move forward. 
And we're not even sure they're going to be able to make these first payments they're supposed to make to these water rights districts, even though it's only, you know, a lot of money to you and I, but really not that much money, $180,000. But we're not convinced they even have that. So, you know, a careful decision, spoke to a bunch of people, consulted stakeholders, the three organizations met and talked carefully and ultimately felt really confident that if we just want to end this thing for once and for all, the right thing to do, kind of somewhat ironically and somewhat in a way that might surprise people, the right thing to do was actually to end the legal fight. So we did it. We feel good about it. We're moving on. And we'll see if Blue Castle can come up with this money or not. To play Angel's advocate here, what might go wrong with this decision to step back? And is there any indicator that would kick off your renewed involvement in resisting these nukes. Yeah, definitely. If this project moves forward, the way in which that will manifest itself is they will be able to put together the resources to submit an early site permit application to the NRC, to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So if they're able to do that, and we're highly skeptical they can, but if they are able to do that, that process does allow for all kinds of public intervention. And it's complicated and it's very legal and it would involve, you know, all kinds of need to resubmit expert testimony and involve grassroots and potentially involve attorneys. But we would have all kinds of opportunities to get involved at that point and to challenge them. So, you know, honestly, we don't think it's going to happen. It's honestly not something I really worry about day to day. Heal Utah has a bunch of other projects and kind of clean air and clean energy work. And that's what we're doing right now with like 99% of our time and budget and staff. But if by some miracle Blue Castle manages to put together this money and to move forward and to apply to the NRC, we're totally ready and poised to return to the fight and continue to resist this. But I just don't think it'll happen. From your mouth to somebody's ears, it's great to know about this set of issues in the American West. And for now, Matt Pichenza, I want to thank you for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much, Libby. It's been a pleasure. And if folks want to find out more information, you know, go ahead and look for Heal Utah on the web. And I should also add, we also have our own podcast. And so if any of those issues that we've talked about today interest people, there's the Heal Utah podcast out there in all the places one finds podcasts. And go ahead and check us out. Matt Pachenza of Heal Utah. You can find out more about the group and connect to their podcast by going to healutah.org. And, of course, we will have the links up on the website. Activist shout-out to the anti-nuclear activists with the No Dakota Access Pipeline protests. Whether you are standing at Standing Rock or praying in your home with tobacco and sage at dawn. Special shout-outs continue to Marius Paul of the Denesulin people of northern Saskatchewan and Jean Stone head of Residents Organized for a Safe Environment in Southern California, who was so involved with the San Onofre shutdown. Both of these gentlemen have been to Standing Rock and sent back powerful first-person reports. Water is life. May we stand with its protectors. Metakwiasin. Here's today's final thought. This is the episode of Nuclear Hot Seat, most likely accessed by mainstream media news professionals I met, I will be meeting at Excellence in Journalism. So this is for you journalists who might be listening to the show for the first time. We who maintain an unshakably critical stance towards the nuclear industry in all of its many forms are in a position to make your lives easier. We've already done the research. We are your personal spotlight team on nuclear issues, putting together the pieces, lacking only the opportunity to get you to listen and study our findings, and then report honestly on what you've found in what we've found. You see, we know the issues. We have legitimate peer-reviewed studies, footnotes from engineers, scientists, researchers, doctors, epidemiologists, and other genuine experts to back our claims. But you'll never find these resources because nuclear industry PR trolls know how to bury what we have to say on page 47 of your Google searches, like you ever even access page 47. But we know where the bodies are buried meaning the bodies of illegally buried nuclear waste. And we know 
what it does to any community that has the misfortune to live nearby. Because there are people there who never suspect why they have such puzzling health problems. What we have lacked are the publishers, editors, news directors, syndicators, columnists, networks, and programming pros who recognize the importance of what we've been doing and go to bat for this perspective on the nuclear story with your higher-ups. You need to take the contrarian voice seriously, not as a minor balancing blip too many column inches down or buried as a 10-second curiosity added into a nuclear industry manipulated story. What we have to say deserves airtime, column inches, columns, editorials, even blog posts under your outlet's banner. You see, you've been taken out of this story by the nuclear industry. And if you want to know how, we can shine a big, fat spotlight on that one, too. As for the stories, we've already done the heavy lifting. All you have to do is ask and then listen. If you want some help, just contact Nuclear Hot Seat. We're a great place to start, and we will refer you to the players who are on our side of the street, who can tell you what the real story is, the one that you've been manipulated away from. We will show you where to look, who to contact, give you links, and get you to the right sources to be able to report our perspective, which we like to refer to as the truth. We can even alert you to when the nuclear story in your area is going to get hot, if it isn't already. And why this is important to your viewers, listeners, readers, as well as how to pull your neighborhood nuclear story together. I promise you, there are Pulitzers waiting for you in your nuclear backyard, if only you bother to look and then report. So if you have ever felt that burning need to follow H. L. Mencken's edict to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, send us an email at info at nuclearhotseat.com or check that spiffy little nuclear hot seat business card I handed you and give me a call. I promise you it will be worth your time. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, September 13, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from miningawareness.wordpress.com, bostonglobe.com, capedownwinders.info, U.S. Department of Energy, cnn.com, m.riverfronttimes.com, japantimes.co.jp, naturalnews.com, news.vice.com, Dr. Timothy Mousseau, the journalism-perverting PR hacks slaving away in their cubicles at World Nuclear News, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the fantastic, passionate, highly motivated, and extremely good-looking anti-nuclear activists from all over the world who gather at Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook, where you are invited to join us and like us and share our posts with your friends and family and base your stories on it. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is now downloaded every month in 112 countries. So as an activist, you, we are not alone. We are linking. And because we've all had our nuclear wake-up call, the edict is do not go back to sleep. Because we're all in the Nuclear Hot Seat. Nuclear Hot Seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear Hot Seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear Hot Seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act 
is shrinking, but the activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.